Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off in the Sagamore Hill, Theodore Roosevelt's summer White House, we were talking about the time the Sagamore Hill House served as the summer White House, naturally. Now we're going to see how it served during the post-presidential years. So you ready? All right, let's begin. Chapter 5, The Post-Presidential Years Theodore Roosevelt knew himself well enough to know that giving up the excitement and power of the White House would be a letdown, and he would need something to provide substantial stimulation. So even before his departure from Washington, D.C., he began planning a hunting trip to Africa with Kermit. T.R. invited scientists, veteran African hunters, and firearm ex experts to Sagamore Hill to help prepare for his specimen collection expedition on behalf of the Smithsonian Institution. Roosevelt departed the capital on March 4, 1909 for Kovnik. He arrived that evening to find Ethel had prepared the house with fireplaces aglow. He wrote to Bammy five days later. We could not have had a pleasanter homecoming. I wanted to be here in late winter when at night, under the full moon, the snow-covered landscape is beautiful beyond description. I am dictating this in the north room, with the big logs blazing in the hearth. So lovely is it that I am utterly unable to miss the White House, and though I miss very much the friends that I used to see at the White House, I am very glad to be home. Even though they could now afford a more ostentatious lifestyle, since the presidential salary at the time was $50,000 a year, bringing him a total of $400,000. $400,000 is now the yearly salary. Anyways, even though they could now afford a more ostentatious lifestyle, Theodore and Edith chose to continue living simply. The frugal Roosevelt's did purchase their first automobile in 1909, but only acquired a Victorian more than a year later. I mean, a Victrola. Three weeks after his homecoming, Roosevelt sailed for Africa. With her husband and Kerman absent and, her son and, the, and the other sons away at school, Edith seized the opportunity to renovate the house. She arranged for the construction of two bathrooms next to the south bedroom and T.R.'s dressing room along with replacing and repairing wallpaper and plaster. Then Edith laid off all the domestic staff, closed up the house, and took Ethel to Europe. It was the first summer since... Sagamore Hill was built that it was unoccupied. Edith returned home for a few months in the winter of 1909 and 1910 to check on the work before she and Ethel met T.R. and Kermit in Sedan. The family toured Europe before a tumultuous welcome in New York in June 1910. On June 20th, two days after their return on June 18th, Ted married Eleanor Butler Alexander in Manhattan. With Alice and Ted gone, life at Sagamore Hill was very different. This summer has marked the definite end of the old Oyster Bay life that all of you children used to lead, T.R. wrote to Ted. But in the fall, Roosevelt wrote his new daughter-in-law that he was content. What I now most want is to stay here in my own home with your mother-in-law, to walk and ride with her, and in the evening sit with her before the great wood fire in the north room and hear the winds shrieking outside, to chop trees and read books, and feel that I am justified in not working. I don't want to be in Africa, or on the ranch, or in the army, or in the White House. I like to think of them all now and then, but the place I wish to be is just where I am. The colonel did not remain secluded at Sagamore Hill for long, however. He, was, he soon was busy writing, politic, politicking, and exploring. T.R. had agreed to serve on the editorial staff of The Outlook, and once or twice a week would go to New York for meetings. Edith relished being back at the house to make more improvements and incorporate the family's acquisitions from the White House years. These included a tiger skin presented by the Dowager Empress of China and pictures sent by Kaiser Wilhelm II. The couple also had to make room for trophies from the African safari, such as a Cape Buffalo head, that was mounted in the front hall. Some of the emptiness caused by Alice and Ted marrying and moving out was filled in August 1911 by the birth of the first Roosevelt grandchild, 
Ted and El Ted and Eleanor's daughter Grace. Edith marked the occasion by painting by planting little pine trees so the baby would have a nice place to pet lay when she came to visit. Mother's preparing the bassinet and the crib and the little bathtub and everything else that was used when all of you were babies, T.R. wrote to Ted. The couple's happiness was upset on September 30th when Edith was riding at a gallop with Theodore and Archie along Oyster Bay Cove Road. Pine Knot, her horse named for the presidential retreat in Virginia, shied and threw her onto the pavement. Unable to revive her, Theodore flagged down a passing delivery van to transport her to the house. Edith was comatose for 36 hours and then for nine days was lucid only periodically. Even after that, she had no recollection of the accident and it lost her sense of taste and smell. She was too weak to venture out of the house for many weeks, but eventually regained her sense of taste. The former president still drew a lot of old friends and admirers to Sagamore Hill. And his growing involvement in politics, his fame, and many interests attracted a never-ending stream of new guests. Father likes the house full of Tom, Dick, and Harry, and I can't quite keep up with the pace but toil panting, Edith wrote to Kermit. One of the guests Edith enjoyed seeing was Archie Butt. <laughs> the Army Major had begun working for TR as a military aide in 1908 and was still working in the White House for William Howard Taft, who died on the Titanic when it sank in 1912, described a visit with Theodore and Edith earlier that year. We went into lunch and had the same simple food as Mrs. Roosevelt always gives her family, Butt wrote. The colonel told him, our menus are a legacy from my Georgian mother. She told us to have rice twice a day and hominy every morning for breakfast, and we group simple meats and vegetables around it, but related a humorous anecdote. It seems that the telephone had been out of order, and word had been sent to the office to have it repaired. Just before the luncheon was over, the colored man, one of those who preferred to work for the Roosevelts in private life than to remain at the right house, said... Colonel, the telephone man has been here, sir, and he says you cut down all the trees this morning which had the wires on them. And he said, too, sir, that you didn't even pull the wires out after the trees fell. The colonel looked guilty as Mrs. Roosevelt began to laugh, but he stopped her quickly by saying, Now, Edith, don't you say a word. It was all your own fault. You always mark the trees I am to cut down, and you did not do it. After lunch, the guests moved to the north room and gathered around the fire. We lighted cigars and continued to smoke and listen to the colonel for at least two hours. You know, he does the most of the talking when his, he gets started. The colonel jumped from subject to subject with the agility of a flying squirrel. As Butt noted, the Roosevelts brought, homes, brought some of the White House staff back to Cove Neck with them. Edith and Theodore, Theodore and Edith were considered good employers, and when they left Washington, D.C., the servants vied to continue working for them, even though it meant taking a pay cut. Among the servants who made the transition with the family was James Amos, who began working for the Roosevelts early in their White House tenure. Initially, he, kept take, he helped take care of the children, but eventually spent most of his time attending to T.R. Soon after going to work for the White House, he was asked to take charge of Sagamore Hill for the summer, probably in 1902. In 1909, T.R. got Amos, who needed to earn more money, a job at the Customs House in New York. But after a year, he came to work and live at Sagamore Hill as the head man and T.R.'s valet until he left around 1913 to take a higher-paying job with the detective agency. Amos returned to Cove Neck before T.R. died. Later, he went to work for the Bu Federal Bureau of Investigation, which became the FBI. Amos's wife, Annie whom he had married in 1909, also worked at Sagamore Hill. The Roosevelts constructed a cottage in 1910 to house the families of Amos and coachman Charles Lee, who was also black. The structure, 26 feet by 20 feet and two and a half stories tall, is situated 800 feet southeast of the main house near the ravine leading to Cold Spring Harbor. The Roosevelts never, re never named it, but 
in the 1940s, it was referred to as the chauffeur's cottage, then Gray Cottage in the 1960s, Gray with an E, and later Gray Cottage, Gray with an A. It now houses the National Park Service employees, it is, and it is not open to the public. Most of the female servants lived on the third floor of the main house, while most of the male servants lived upstairs in the stable or off the property. The 1910 census listed Theodore and Edith, four of their children, and eight servants at Sagamore Hill. Besides Amos, 32, who is listed age 32, who is listed as a messenger, his wife, age 26, and Lee, age 36, also listed as a messenger. There was Lee's wife, Clara, age 35, who worked intermittently as a chambermaid and later did housework. Mary Sweeney, a 22-year-old single housemaid from Ireland. 48-year-old cook, Mita Bat, a German immigrant with one child. Waitress and single Irish immigrant, Catherine Daly, age 35. And Arthur Williams, an 18-year-old black butler who was single. Edith's interactions with Amos is reinforces the image of her as an employer who did not miss much. Ethel recalled that Amos's duties included dusting part of the house weekly, and when he forgot to do it, her mother would write his name in the dust as a quiet but embarrassing reprimand. Back in Cove Neck full-time, Roosevelt resumed his customary activities. Amos wrote, I'm sure he was never so happy as when he was out in the ground on the, the grounds of his estate with an axe in his hand, chopping down a tree or building a fence. The colonel kept seven axes by the front door, using each for a day before having the superintendent sharpen them. <laughs> he continued his study of nature. In 1910, T.R. made a list of all the birds he saw or heard around Sagamore Hill. There were 42, ranging from a little green heron to a screech owl. T.R. described Sagamore Hill and his life there in a 1913 article in the Outlook. <clears throat> At Sagamore Hill, we love a great many things, birds and trees and books, and thing, and all things beautiful, and horses and rifles and children and hard work and the joy of life. We have great fireplaces, and in them the logs roar and crackle during the long winter evenings. The big piazza is for the hot, still afternoons of summer. Roosevelt elaborated poetically. Many birds dwell in the trees, round the house, or in the pasture 